Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. So, um, okay, <laughs> maybe better. So my name is Ariane Courto. I'm a PhD student. Uh, I worked with, uh, thank you. <laughs> I worked with uh, Jérémy Bayon and Marc Fouchard, and my PhD was about uh, characterizing chaos in meteoroid streams. So today I will present to you some of my results on the draconids and leonids, and also the beginning of my work on the torrents. So why the draconids and leonids? Well, you know they are meteor showers, and uh, what's interesting, and they come from uh, varying uh, parent bodies. So the draconids come from a Jupiter family comet, and the leonid from a Halley type comet, which means we have very different uh, um, uh, dynamical environments, which can be interesting to analyze. So let's go straight into the chaos maps that I used to characterize chaos. The first one I did on the draconids, so I basically took a lot of draconids and I integrated them for 1,000 years, and from that I was able to obtain this a very pretty map. So here you have the uh, initial semi-major axis uh, here, and then on top there you have the initial mean anomaly, and in color you have the chaoticity, and the lighter it is, the more chaotic it is. So you can see very well, I think there's some very beautiful uh, darker lobe, which corresponds to uh, more stable areas in the maps. And they actually correlate very well with mean motion resonances with Jupiter, which I've represented on the map here. Now, for the Leonids, I did a very similar thing, but I integrated the particle for 2,000 years. And I also obtained a map with some very pretty lobe um, that are also correlated with a mean motion resonance with Jupiter. So basically, we have mean motion resonance uh, who uh, make sure that the particles inside them stay much more stable than in any other place on my maps. So this is actually related to close encounters. So I took a look at the effect of those close encounters with Jupiter specifically. So for the draconids, I obtained this kind of map. So it's the same map as before, but I only plotted particles that do encounter Jupiter. Meaning inside the lobes here, you see very well there is no close encounter with Jupiter. I also did the same thing with the leonids, and you can see that it's the same thing. Inside the lobes, you have almost no encounter with Jupiter. So what happens is that the mean Martian resonance with Jupiter trap the particles and that prevents them from meeting uh, Jupiter. And so everywhere else they do encounter it and so they get more chaotic than uh, the ones in the lobes. So this is a basic uh, um, mechanism, but in these maps, I didn't add non-gravitational forces. I only took very large particles so I could uh, neglect the NGFs completely. So it was time to add them. So what I did was I took very similar uh, initial conditions, but I just modified the radius of the particle so we could see the effect of the NGFs. Now, I just have to tell you before the next part that I actually did the same kind of study for the Geminids. So I had an expectation here. I knew that with the Geminids, uh, when you add the NGF, the lobes completely disappear. There is no more effect of uh, resonance. So I thought, okay, maybe we'll have a similar thing. And well, we'll see. For the Draconids, I obtained this map. So the only difference is the shape of the lobe in the middle. And the other one on the side are a bit fuzzier, but that's it. So I was very disappointed. And then I did the Leonids, and it's even worse because the only difference is here, where you have a bit more chaos, and that's it. So my question was why? Why is it that the NGF do not change much the dynamics for the dragons and Leonids? So the first reason is actually related to the NGFs themselves. We know that the force that can make the particle escape an MR is pointing Robertson. And for the draconids, the effect of pointing Robertson is to diminish the semi-major axis of the draconids of only 0.006 astronomical units over the thousand years of integration. So it's a lot of number, but basically it's not much uh, compared to an environment like the Geminids. Now, another part of the answer is also the width of the mean motion resonance. So I worked with uh, somebody in my lab, Lem uh, Mullen Feyenfest, who actually was able to compute the border of this mean motion resonance. You can see it in black in my map here. And the maximum width for the draconids is 0 0.37 astronomical units. So it's a very wide MMR, and the pointing robeson is not so important. If you take a look at the units, you actually have very similar results. So pointing robeson is about the same effect. And for the MMR, it actually is so big that on this map, I was only able to plot the left-hand side, uh, left border, while the right border is at the outside of the map. It's uh, actually 1.03 astronomical unit wide, so it's very, very wide. So we have a combination for the dragonids and leonids 
of an MMR that's very, very wide and anticorbacin, which is very weak, well, not very strong, let's say. So they can't uh, escape the MMRs and that's why the maps are so similar. So here I kind of give you a quick overview of the kind of mechanism I could find for the draconids and leonids. And now it's time to talk about the turrets. So the turrets, uh, for the parent body, first of all, we thought it was a comet 2P Enki, but recently Orion Egal actually showed that it might not be the case uh, with a dynamic analysis. And the current hypothesis is that another body could have created both Enki and the turrets, but we don't have a precise, like we have some ideas of what the body could be, but it's not um, so sure yet. So this is the challenge part of the turret challenge of my title. Now, the torus is also made of many different branches, and I only chose two branches to study, the northern and the southern torus, because they are very well known and thought it would be easier. Uh, so because I had so many uncertainties about the torus, I thought I would start slow and I would go from the observations. So I took a look at the databases and had a first problem, which is that in the database, there is no mean anomaly. So if any of you are used to work with database and dynamical work, I would be very interested to know how you actually found a way to answer this problem, because the only solution I could find was simply to choose a mean anomaly randomly between 0 and 360 degrees. And that worked, but, you know, if I could be more precise, I would like that. Uh, so... But it was the same idea. I took particles uh, in, uh, I took initial conditions from the database. I integrated those particles for 1,000 years. And just to make it simple, I took large particles so we could neglect the NGF for now. And well, this is the maps I've obtained. So as you can see, there's not much to see compared to the previous ones, uh, but we can see that it's very chaotic. We have an OFLI here that goes very high, much higher than we've seen for the dragons and leonids. Maybe you can see here, but there's some kind of dark line, which kind of looks like an MMR, but I don't want to be too assertive on this. And there is the main problem. The orbital elements are on a very wide interval. So uh, even if I try to be very uh, hard on the database to really choose um, initial conditions that would fit with the toroids, despite all of this, I have very wide ranges of orbital elements, which means my mouse may not be precise enough to make important characteristics appear. So my next question was, how do I do more restricted integrations? And so I decided to try and take a look at the radiance. So I took a look at all the particles I simulated before, and I selected those who encounter the Earth, and I computed their radiance. And this is the kind of things I obtained. The red dot here is basically where the um, theoretical radiance of the northern and southern torrents are. And so what I did was simply to choose particles that are close to this radiance. And among those, I also chose so the particles who are um, who have a speed and data observation that fits with the predicted ones for the torrents, the northern and southern torrents. So with this, I had a smaller sample and I could take a look at their initial conditions and from them restart the process of doing chaos maps. So you can see here, for example, in the semi-major axis, I have a much more restricted one. That's good. But I still have a very chaotic map I don't detect any MMR, which was very surprising because we know from the literature we're supposed to detect some. And um, my ongoing, for the moment, my hypothesis is that they're probably too thin. And so, yes, this is a hypothesis for now. Um, and the another interesting fact was I redid the same kind of procedure as before with the radiance in this map with those particles, and I couldn't detect any southern turrets. I actually have no idea why. That seems very strange to me because I still have pretty wide orbital elements. So I'm very surprised of this. But uh, yes, if same, if you have any idea, I would be happy to discuss this. Three minutes. Thank you. And uh, so in the end, with this map, I can truly can say that the link between the torrids and its hypothetical parent body is difficult because of chaos. Definitely has played a big role, but I'm wondering if there's another reason. And for now, uh, because my maps are not more precise, I, I can't be more precise in my answer. So I will finish by recapitulating the important points in my talks. So first of all, I talked about the big mechanism I saw in chaos maps regarding uh, draconids and leonids, but they're also true for the geminids. So we saw that there's, the MMRs can trap large particles and prevent them from meeting with the planets that's uh, at the origin of the MMR. So for dragons and leonids, they can't meet Jupiter. 
if they had inside MMRs with Jupiter. Um, and then we also saw that uh, pointing Robertson can make enough diffusion for particles to escape the MMR, but only if the MMR is thin enough and that pointing Robertson is strong enough, so depending on the orbit of the particle. Finally, for the toroids, I still have lots of questions and work to do, but it seems it's a very, very chaotic um, stream. I uh, would need to do more, more restricting iterations, and I also want to keep working on the radians because they might not be precise enough yet. But yes, that's where I am right now. So thank you so much for listening. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer.